John MacArthur, what is the irreparable harm of gays being married? Well, I think there are a number of things that we need to talk about. One is it would destroy the family. I mean, obviously, God designed the family to be a man and a woman to produce a child. It is the DNA. It's the genetic structure of civilization. If you don't have that, you don't have civilization. So you're striking it at the very core of its existence. But what does the state have to do with that? You, God can do it, and as a religious person, you can practice it, but why should the state be involved in a marriage? Well, typically the state has always involved, yeah. always been involved in a marriage, and I think that because the state's responsibility is to uphold what is right, to uphold righteousness. I mean, it's in the fabric of human thinking to understand a man and a woman make a marriage and a family. God has put that in the very thinking of people. It's in the heart. It's there. The think? state upholds that standard, always has in every state, in every human history, factor of human history. Do you favor civil unions? You know, the gay president said that should yeah, be left Gay up and state. lesbian people can do whatever they want. Uh, they can do that in this culture or any other culture, but they don't have the right to determine marriage for a whole nation. So it's, it's the marriage aspect, not the, if a state wants to pass that civil unions are okay right. to give rights. We're talking rights. about two things, Larry. Okay. We're talking about an issue of civil union. That's a civil issue. If you ask me about whether it's moral or whether it's right, then it no. becomes a biblical issue. That might come up later, but okay. we know. We know but a civil right. issue, okay. sure, they have the right to make a relationship if they want. Chad, why do you want to be married? Why do you want the right to be married? It, you know, I'll be honest with you. If you'd asked me this question uh, a year ago, I wouldn't care. And I said, why do I want to get involved with that institution? Why would I want to have ultimately wind up having having my things decided by a court and where they go. Mm -hmm. And then I fell in love a year ago. And I, he's on, on the road right now. When I wake up in the morning, I miss him a lot. I miss him right in, in my belly. And for the first time in my life, I started thinking about this institution of marriage and what my parents talked about and about building a life with somebody else. And when I woke up today, the president told me that I couldn't have that. The president said he would take, turn the Constitution around and make it a document of exclusion and tell me that I'm a second-class citizen. That's not okay. And then I fell in love. Would you please get that dog out of here? There are homosexuals here in New York. They're liable to think that's a gerbil on steroids. Let's be more sensitive. Where's PETA when you really need him? If those people are going to be in heaven back there, if those people are the ones who the ones who have armaments on their poster and everything, if they're going to be in heaven, I'm ready to go to hell. I'm ready to go to hell. The same Bible, the same Bible that the president is going to put his hand on that says no same-sex marriage. What are you doing hanging around a bunch of right-wing Christians? What, what, what are you guys doing hanging around us? This isn't Berkeley, pal. This isn't Berkeley, buddy. John, what do you say to those who say, what about Chad and his, his love of his life being together? Isn't that better than, say, the, the heterosexual marriage where the, one of the partners cheats? Who is contributing more to the moral decay of the society? The adulterous husband with the female wife or the loving gay couple who don't do that? Yeah, well, you're asking me to do something I really can't do, and that is make a judgment on which sin is better or, or worse than the other. Um, we've suffered in this country from adultery, divorce, the abuse of children, pedophilia, you name it. I'm not going to classify those in rank. They're sins, and they destroy the family. And homosexuality and is homosexuality, a sin. homosexuality, yeah. Therefore, uh, it's a choice. It's a choice you make. It's a sinful choice. Did you choice. make a choice to be heterosexual? I, I don't think I had to make a choice to what be heterosexual. Mean? I think that's a natural Wait thing. A Wait a minute. In other words, one is a choice and one is not. Yeah. So he was unlucky because, in your life. Because you're not talking about, because it's natural to be heterosexual. That's what do you built, mean by natural? Well, yeah. I mean, that's the way God made us. That's but the if normal. he doesn't feel that way, what is he then? He's not a sinner. It wasn't his decision. Yeah, I think it was his decision. I would love, absolutely love for the pastor to point out for me where, when in my life I made that decision. Because I have to tell you, it caused a lot of pain in my family. It caused a lot of pain in me. It's a very, very tough thing that I had to go through. I don't remember making that decision. If I did, maybe you can point it out, but that wasn't the case for me. I'll approach it's it who I way. am. You also said that, that it was in the fabric of the human being to, that, that to understand that marriage was between a man and a woman. And that's way family was. It must not be because it's not in the fabric of who I am. It's not the way I see it. I think families come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Well, uh, let me respond this, this way, Chad, and say it had to be in the fabric of humanity or you wouldn't be here. 
I believe the reproduction is. I'll give you that. I absolutely believe the reproduction is. However, I think family, the definition of family, and the definition of reproduction are very, very different right. things. Uh, well, what, what I said earlier is the DNA, the genetic structure mm -hmm. of humanity, of civilization, of society, is family. Everybody knows that. That's in the heart. That's how it works. You're coming along with others who are homosexual in, in their perspective mm -hmm. and overturning what is natural to could everyone. They, could they be also be asking to the privilege of something you have preached for years. Marriage is a healthy, wonderful thing, and they're saying, let us in plunk it yeah, Why would you me, deny it to them? Let me respond to Chad, too, just Please. on a personal basis, sure. Chad, by saying, um, I, I don't think at some point you said, okay, I'm gonna be a homosexual. I got two alternatives, you know, I'm gonna go be a homosexual. But I do think whatever sin patterns show up in our lives, and they may be different for us, we can choose to continue down those paths of sin, whether it's adultery or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, or we can say, look, this is sin, and I need to deal with this in my heart. If this is the way I'm being led, it's not right, it doesn't honor God, it's not according to His Word, it's not going to ultimately bring blessing on my life. I make the choice at that point. I can't make a choice to be a sinner, okay? I am. We all are. But once you start down the path of sin, if you recognize that it is that, then you look to the Lord for the remedy to that. And I respect you beyond anything for your belief on that. I really do. And let me tell you where the sin was in my life as I see it. Uh, when I was in high school and, and, and kids were getting picked on, and, and I was one of those kids picking on other kids, the ones that... Well, John MacArthur. In fact, just watch how Pastor MacArthur not only biblically confronts a whole array of various issues, but how he consistently drives any and all of those type debates regardless of the topic, back to where they belong, on the authority of Scripture. John, do you question it? I mean, do you question whether there is a God? I don't question whether there is a God. I don't even question what God chooses to allow. Um, it's not a matter of my opinion. I, as a Bible teacher and one who believes that the Bible is the authoritative Word of God, Scripture tells us that God is absolutely sovereign. Larry, I wanted to ask your panel if uh, these hijackers are in heaven or hell right now. Rabbi Kushner, where are they? Well, I feel a little bit excluded by that last statement, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I've got problems with hell. I, I have trouble believing in a God who would send people to eternal damnation. I might be prepared to do it. I'd rather think God is beyond that. I think they're not in heaven. I think heaven is reserved for people who've lived a good life. I think they have simply disappeared. They had dreams of an afterlife, they had dreams of pleasure and praise and being welcomed and all that. And I don't think they are anywhere. They are non-existent and that's the best thing that can happen to them. Deepak Chopra, where do you think they are? Larry, I don't know where they are. Only God knows where they are. But I have a problem with some of your panelists. Because I don't think Christ was a Christian. I don't think Buddha was a Buddhist. And I don't think that Muhammad was a Mohammedan. I think it's just that kind of thing that says, only the way of Jesus is right, then the others say only the way of Muhammad is right, only the way of Buddha is right, only the way of Krishna is right. We have sacrificed a universal being and created a tribal chief with our gods. And that's the problem. John? Yeah, I, I just don't think, uh, uh, all due respect, that uh, Deepak is the authority on that. I don't think uh, Rabbi Kushner is the authority either. Nor I don't think I'm the authority. Well, where are you going to go? You have to go to an authoritative book. And that is? The Bible. Back to the question about God. Again, uh, I hear all these responses, but we have to go back to some authority outside of ourselves. I mean, I can't define God for the universe from starting with me. Uh, God in the scripture is the creator and sustainer of the universe. He's the sovereign over All everything things, right? who in, was incarnated in Jesus Christ, came down to die on a cross to provide atonement so that the sins of those who repent were paid for in full and therefore heaven was open to them. I'm a, I'm a practicing Catholic. I got married in the church two plus years. Uh, I don't see what we're doing in terms of advancing the bond of love and monogamy and extending that to families, families of same sex, in any way, shape or form, takes away anything from the church or the sanctity of the union that my wife and I have. I would just like to ask the mayor as a practic practicing Catholic, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? 
Yeah, look, Pastor, I'm not going to get in a theological debate with you. That no, would that's be not a theological debate. That's look. just a straight question. Do you believe the Bible is the authoritative Word of God? Yeah, I, 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 with respect, I guess I do. Now the response. Well, then the Bible says when God created man, He said one man, yeah. one woman, cleave together for life. That's a family. Jesus in the New Testament reaffirms that. All the writers of the Old and the New Testament affirm it. Um, adultery, bestiality, homosexuality was punishable by death according to the Old Testament law because it was so serious in those early years because it literally shattered the hope of civilization. The, the New Testament offers us, of course, grace. Those sins are sins. They are forgivable. Jesus died to redeem us from those sins. We're all sinners. You don't want to categorize well, sinners. what does the state have to do But the yeah. point at this juncture right. is, well, he's representing the state. He's That's coming totally back and saying, I'm a Catholic, and I'm a Catholic and somehow this fits into my Catholicism and I'm saying well what's your authority then? I'm back to the bottom line which is that kind of a union is sinful before God and uh, but the acts of they're doing are not sinful they're raising two children who didn't people didn't want that's a wonderful yeah. thing that's do, the right? good part but it, the context in which that happens is a context that advocates and flaunts the sin of homosexuality which even, is but even if, it, if that's the case even if that is the case and listen we'll all find out at the end of the day can't we let God decide that well God has already decided that I mean it, it's in the Word of God it's unmistakably clear then in the Bible. Then what are we so worried about? What are we so scared about? Why, why all this trouble to, to prevent me from being able to accept these privileges while I'm here uh, if God will ultimately take care well, of it? Uh, let, me, let me answer that personally Please. because the Bible says in no uncertain terms that no homosexual or adulterer will ever inherit the kingdom of God. Why is there so much then conflict, do you think, in the Christian community? Well, so much debate. Uh, maybe we need to, maybe we need to go. Yeah, maybe we need to go back to the Bible and see what the Bible actually says. Is there a Christian position mm -hmm. on this war, well, tending this, war? Yeah, Larry. The singular Christian is Jesus. So the question needs to be asked: What was Jesus' view? And I think explicitly in Scripture, you have a number of things. So, of course, there are those who are doing a wonderful job, biblically and accurately, defending the faith. And Christians as a whole need to learn from their exceptional examples. I want to go out to our two pastors tonight. Uh, pastor Rob Brendel, the associate pastor who took over leadership there at New Life Church. And also, highly acclaimed John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Community Church. Uh, Reverend MacArthur... Are you convinced in your heart that homosexuality is a sin? Absolutely, it's a sin, and it's not a matter of some conviction in my heart. It's a matter of what the Scripture says. It's absolutely crystal clear in Scripture that it is a sin, and there's no question about it. And, and the, the response that I have to the situation with Ted Haggard, while there's certainly compassion and sympathy, is just plain outrage. And before all the talk about restoration, and he's our Okay, what's friend, restoration? What is restoration? Yeah. Well, well first of all, uh, there is no restoration to pastoral ministry or public ministry of any kind. He has breached the biblical standard. No man can be a preacher or a pastor who is not above reproach, who is not a one-woman man. That is explicit in the New Testament. The Bible says, the one who lives a blameless life will minister to me. Paul said, I, I buffet my body into submission so that in preaching to others, I do not become disqualified. Well, I have a question, and I, I am not a, a biblical scholar, although I've, I've tried to read the whole thing. Uh, to you, Pastor Rob... In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, go down to verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes these words, Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Here is the good news that answers our question. What does God think of homosexuals? It is God's desire that they be saved, that they be justified, that they be 
sanctified, that they be washed. And that homosexuality and homosexual behavior be only part of their past, so that it can be said of them, such were some of you. Now the list here is interesting for a lot of reasons. There are many sins. We're just looking at the sin of homosexuality, but there are all these other kinds of sins as well from which we need to be delivered and washed and sanctified and justified. Also, this list gives us some idea of the kind of people who were part of the Corinthian church. Now, if you knew that a church was full of ex-fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, covetous, alcoholics, slanderers, extortioners, etc., etc., it might be the kind of crowd you'd want to avoid. But these are precisely the people who made up the Corinthian church. And that tells us not only about the church, but it tells us a lot about that society. It was a society not unlike our own society, which is full of the same kinds of people. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, etc. Nothing much has changed. So, this church, Grace Community Church, like the church at Corinth, is populated by people who fit into these former categories. But you have been washed. You have been sanctified, separated from those kinds of behaviors, and you have been justified before God because God has set His loving forgiveness and grace upon you because of faith in Christ. I have baptized and others have baptized in the waters of baptism right here. People who have been delivered from all these sins, including homosexuality. By God's grace and through His saving love, homosexual sinners are redeemable. And some of you sitting out there are living testimony to that fact. I remember sitting in the office one day and receiving a phone call from a man who said, My name is David. Chastain. He said in a faint voice, I am in a hospital. I need you to come and see me. I went to a nearby hospital. I walked in the room. I knew immediately he was dying of AIDS because I know the look. I've seen it enough. He was surrounded by friends, all of whom were obviously homosexual. He was being attended to by an obviously homosexual nurse or attendant. And I came up to his bed and he grasped my hand as tightly as he could in his weakened condition and said, I have lived a homosexual life for over 20 years. I was raised in a Christian family, in a Christian home, in a Christian church. I know the gospel. I have rejected it and hated it all my life. Now I'm going to die from AIDS and I do not want to go to hell. Can you help me? And I said, of course I can. And I began to give him the gospel, and the room was empty in 10 seconds. <laughs> I'm telling you, 10 seconds, if that. And he opened his heart to Christ. I prayed a long prayer, and I asked God to be gracious to him and to save him while he clutched my hand. After which, I said, if you desire to pray, this is your opportunity to ask for forgiveness. And. He did, and he prayed one of the most heart-wrenching prayers I've ever heard in my life, pleading with God to forgive him for the wretched life that he had lived in defiance of what he had been raised to know is true. And after this long and passionate prayer, he stared at the wall, and I said to him, what are you looking at? He said, I'm looking at the clock over there because I want to remember the time of my new life. And he was overwhelmed with a sense of joy, 
He said, I have a lot to make up for in a very little time. I took some books down to him, which he read as rapidly as he could. He gave testimony of his faith in Christ. And I think if I remember right, it was about five days and he was gone. Not all of the conversions like that are quite that dramatic. That was one of the most dramatic. I'll tell you about another one at the end. One of the supreme tragedies in our day is reclassification of homosexuality as a non-sin, as a normal behavior, as an acceptable behavior, even as a noble behavior because that's the way you're made. Instead of defining it the way the Bible defines it, as a perversion from which you need to be rescued. The uh, best statistics that I could find indicate that somewhere between 1 and 2 percent of the population in our country would classify themselves as engaging in homosexual sex acts. But this very small portion of our population is commanding the attention of the 98 to 99 percent of the rest of us. They're endeavoring to make us accept the fact that this is some kind of normal behavior. Not only that, they deserve special treatment because they've been so abused in the past. Their agenda is simple. They just want to desensitize us to the sinful character of this. They, they want to desensitize us. They don't need us to become advocates. They just need us not to care. To roll over, if you will. To acknowledge them as just another minority who should enjoy same human rights that others enjoy. But this is not a race of people. This is a sexual behavior. Nothing more, nothing less. It is ridiculous to assume that because they do a specific sexual act or acts, they therefore demand certain rights and should be granted those rights. I don't know how you can separate it from giving the same rights to people who do other deviant acts, like pedophiles, murderers, rapists, drug dealers, they all have a different orientation. Should they have rights? Wife beaters? Child molesters? Where do we end this? All sin comes because people are bent toward it. And when a society decides that certain sins and certain sinners should have special rights, they have moved long and far from a true understanding of sin and Scripture. Are we going to get the same rights to rapists? Well, this is just the way they're bent. They're drawn that way. They have strong impulses that way. Um, they should be able to express themselves in any way that they like, and we should give them rights because they're bent that direction. People who are rapists, I understand, are compelled, driven, so are those who are child molesters, pedophiles. Their preference has become the cause of the most devastating public health epidemic in this nation's history. They launched the AIDS epidemic. Their preference, if it continues along with the other sexual deviations in our culture, will cause the most devastating corruption that any nation has known since the plagues of the Middle Ages. Say nothing of the financial eruption in the medical health community trying to take care of all these people. They are very aggressive in recruiting children as young as they can get to them in elementary school to draw them into the pit of their perversion and make themselves feel normal. They have now been given the right to adopt children so that they can have their own casualties right under their own noses in their own houses. This would be like taking two mass murderers and telling them they can adopt children. 
and expecting that a normal child would be produced in that kind of environment. Their behavior is nothing more than the expression of a sexual lust that is unnatural, twisted, and uncontained. And no matter how you try to glamorize it and make it look normal and make it look nice and all of that, let me give you some statistics. 80% of people engaged in homosexual acts say half their partners are total strangers. One out of two. How many partners do they have? The latest statistics that I can find indicate that the average homosexual has had more than 500 sexual partners. 500. By their own admission, 50% of them total strangers. 30% have had 1,000 partners, some as many as 1,600. The latest I could find out on the average, the average has 300 a year, almost one different person a day. The conduct of their acts has no bounds. It all was launched in what were called gay bathhouses, where they used to have anonymous contact with 10 to 30 unknowns in one day. Similar kind of behavior has now found its way into other places. Every conceivable and inconceivable act is included, none of which we need to talk about. They are 1 to 2 percent of the population, but 50 percent of the people with AIDS. One in 20 of these people is a child molester. Of the normal population, it's about 1 in 500 at the, mo at the least. They are 1,000 times more likely to get AIDS, 100 times more likely to be murdered. 80% of them have sexually transmitted diseases. The average death of our population is now 75. The average American dies at 75. The average person engaged in homosexual life dies at 39. 2% live to, live to 65. Just to take the glamour off it, that's what it really is. It is a sexual lust gone mad. It is suicidal. And I could give an almost endless parade of statistics and a litany of information on the problem, which doesn't, after a certain point, help. What is more important is to understand it from God's viewpoint for what it really is. So let's go back to our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There is a mention there in verse 9 of the word effeminate. Effeminate. Marginal note in the NAS says effeminate by perversion. Molokos is the Greek word. Uh, it seems to have been a technical term for the passive partner in homosexual relationships. Martin Gingrich, one of the uh, best of Greek lexicon says that the word probably also included men and boys who allowed themselves to become male prostitutes and were the passive partners. It's more than effeminate in the sense that we think of effeminate as a kind of superficial style. It is a kind of homosexual prostitution. Then the word homosexuals, arsena koites, two Greek words. One meaning sexual relations, the other meaning men. It is men having sexual relations with men. It means just that. These people practice a sin which excludes them from the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will never belong to God's kingdom as long as they continually live in that lifestyle. Some say nearly all the Caesars were engaged in homosexual behavior. It was so rampant, at least 14 out of the first 15, according to some historians. Nero, current Caesar at the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, had taken a boy named Sporus and had him castrated, then married him in a full wedding and lived with him as his wife. 
So Paul's world was not very much different than our world. Homosexual behavior, like all the other sins that are listed there, was everywhere. He confronted it for what it is. It is a sinful behavior. It is a sinful act. He was not homophobic. He was not overreacting. Because he was a repressed homosexual himself, he was true to divine scripture, and he was true to the sinner to tell him his sin for the sake of repentance. One Sunday morning in this very auditorium, I stood up and read Psalm 107, as I often read a psalm, and I came to verse 10. There were those who dwelled in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled. There was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. And I went on to read a further portion of the psalm. But one verse stood out. Verse 6, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way. Now, if you're living in a homosexual world, the word straight has significant meaning. Sitting right back there was a young man named Robert Lagerstrom. He was one of the leaders in the gay pride parade in Los Angeles. He was dying of AIDS. He said to one of his friends, I'm dying. I'm afraid to die. I'm not ready to die. Where can I go to get help? One of his fellow sinners said, there's a church in the valley called Grace Community Church. Go there. He came here. I read that psalm. He was a man crying to the Lord in trouble. He was a prisoner in misery and chains. He was in the darkness and the shadow of death. And I read that psalm. Later that day, he said to me, you read that, and I knew it was in the right place. You read that, and I kept saying to myself, how do I get delivered? How do I get delivered? Where do I go? What do I do? And then he said, you got up and you preached this really long, long sermon. <laughs> and the more you talked, the more irritated I became. Because I wanted to be delivered, and you kept talking and talking. I didn't hear a word you said. So... He came at the end of the service, came to the prayer room, fell on his face before God, repented, embraced Jesus Christ as Lord, was wonderfully saved, and I baptism, baptized him right here in these waters. Before I did that, he gave testimony to everyone he knew. And his, when the gay pride parade came, all the leaders of the parade, when it came by, because he lived on the route, came to his house to wish him well as he was dying, gave him all the gospel, went to heaven. We speak the truth about the sin in order that we might speak the truth about the Savior who forgives, right? Father, we thank you again for your word. It opens up so much to us, so current, so pertinent. Thank you for the clarity with which it speaks to these matters. May we be faithful to call these people who are caught in this vicious sin to repentance, not accepting the sin but loving the sinner enough to give the hope of the gospel. And would you continue to save and wash and sanctify and justify sinners in this church of all kinds. And may we live lives that please you and honor you as those who are forgiven. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Now you turn and realize that for the first time... Now, see, people, when I travel... 
Be, you know, uh, 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 there's two questions when we have an open Q&A. Typically, there's two questions we can always ask. Where's American prophecy? Anybody who studied eschatology recognizes that all the major players are clearly identified. America is conspicuous in its absence of mention. So that's a valid area of discussion. And then the second question we often get to the spiritually mature audience is say, why hasn't God judged America? Billy Graham quipped several decades ago very cleverly. He says, if God doesn't judge America, they have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, Thomas Jefferson said the same thing back in 1781. He says, I tremble for my country when I recall that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. So the, so the point is, why are we surprised? Now, there is, if you're going to start talking about the judgment of God, you quickly discover there's at least four or five kinds of judgment. There's calamitous judgment like Noah and all of that. There's eschatological judgment like Revelation 6 and following and so on. One of his judgments could be called his abandonment judgment. Imagine yourself as Samson on that third visit to Delilah, and when you wake up, you discover that your strength is gone. In a few seconds, you realize that God has abandoned you. Can you imagine how Samson felt as he realized the significance of not being able to break loose like he had before and so forth. The abandonment judgment. That's exactly what Hosea was called to present to the northern kingdom. And God says to him, leave Ephraim alone. He's joined himself to idols. That summarizes the whole indictment of God against the northern kingdom, his abandonment judgment. Now, I have preached for years, Second Chronicles 7:14. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal the land. God says, if you do four things, I'll do three. And I preach that. I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure I can anymore. Why? Because there is, when I was redoing our Genesis commentary, I was startled to discover how God's primary jealousy is as his role as creator. Not as redeemer. To, be, to understand his redemption, you have to have the word of God. So you have an excuse, so to speak, not knowing that. But you do not have an excuse about the creation because the creation testifies of itself, of him. Psalm 19, etc. So the point is, I was startled to discover that God's primary passion or jealousy, if you want to call it that, is as his role as creator. And I also was startled to discover there is a specific judgment of God that is poured out upon a nation that fails to acknowledge him as creator. I used to read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to the end, and I thought it was about homosexuality. No, it isn't. Not if you read it carefully. In that passage, starting at verse, Romans 1, from verse 18 to the end, three times in that passage, God says, because they did not recognize me as creator, I, God, will give them over to that which is not convenient. And then it describes homosexuality in terms that you can't read it to a small family. You know, you know, to young people. I mean, it's pretty graphic. The point is, it's not about homosexuality. I always thought it was. No, read it carefully. It's about a judgment of God that God puts upon a culture that fails to acknowledge him as creator. Homos and I'm not talking homosexual. I always looked at it as an individual choice, as, you know, as, as my friend uh, Don Perkins pointed out, you know, that that's an issue for the individual. Fine. As a collective thing, it's a judgment of God. And so as I read any paper, pick it up, I'm beginning to suspect, I'll say it carefully, I'm beginning to suspect that the judgment of God has begun. Not because of the earthquakes and that stuff, no, 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 no. It's because of, the, see, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality. It was the public condoning of it, okay? And to see where we're headed, uh, I think you start talking about Jimmy Carter, yeah. I think it's one of those rare comparisons that I think it's unfair to Jimmy Carter to compare him to Obama because Obama is a sworn enemy. Obama is a sworn enemy of everything I stand for. And so... Uh, is it God versus science? Let's meet our panel. Here in Los Angeles, John MacArthur, pastor, teacher of the Grace Community Church, author of The Battle for the Beginning, Creation, Evolution, and the Bible, host of Grace to You, and president of the Masters College and founder of the Masters Seminary in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In Los Angeles, Deepak Chopra, the best-selling author, How to Know God, and founder of the Chopra Center. His blog site, www.intentblog.com, now has a discussion on the topic of creation versus evolution theory. John MacArthur, do you believe that the world is only 5,000 years old? 
Oh, no, I wouldn't say necessarily 5,000, but I would say I doubt that it's more than 10,000 years old. So all this other proof of millions of years of cavemen don't mean anything? Well, I, I think there may have been cavemen, but I don't think millions of years has been proven. You don't think any of that has been proven? No. All right. Hold on. Uh, Dr. Dr. Forrest, your concept of uh, how can you out and out turn down creationism since if evolution's true, why are there still monkeys? Should it be taught at all? But it should never be presented to children in a science class in a public school as science, because it isn't. It's a religious belief. Deepak, is it a faith issue? It is a faith issue. I totally agree with her. I think uh, we have to look at the scientific evidence, which says that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. The planet is only 3.8 billion. Human beings have been around for... 200,000 years in the form that we know them, but, you know, hominids have been around for a long time. Now, having said that, there is evidence in science that there is creativity in the universe, that consciousness may not be an emergent property, that uh, physical matter may be an emergent property, that consciousness conceives and governs and constructs and actually becomes what we call mind and then body and the physical universe. Yeah, well, I think intelligent design is the only possible scientific position to hold because we have intelligence in the universe. It has to come from intelligence. Because we have complexity, it has to come from complexity. The silver bullet, Larry, is DNA. Before an understanding of DNA, uh, there was a lot of confusion and a lot of belief in evolution. It was like the emperor's new clothes. It was really naked but thought it was dressed up. Before an understanding of DNA, uh, there was a lot of confusion and a lot of belief in evolution. It was like the emperor's new clothes. It was really naked, but thought it was dressed up. DNA has, I think, spelled the end of traditional naturalistic evolution, which essentially says complexity comes out of simplicity. It can't happen. The silver bullet is not a single example of reproduction leading to an increased amount of genetic material right. necessary to produce a more right. complex organism That's has ever happened. As someone religion, religion, though, you can't prove Adam and Eve, can you? Oh, I, don't, I don't think you can prove Adam and Eve, except that you know somebody so was there believe. to begin. You believe it. Yeah, well, we're, we're talking about two different things. Intelligent design is the only rational way to view right. the universe. Somebody right. intelligent made it. Religion does, does and who that intelligence you, is. Does it pun to you who made the intelligence? Who well, created I, the creator? I accept the Bible mean. as the source, the authoritative source that tells me it was God. And something or someone has to be eternal. And the Bible says it is God who is the eternal one. See, when he says that, he's denying all of biology, all of anthropology, all of geology, all of astronomy, all of cosmology, all of evolution. It's all of physics, that, well, all of chemistry, and all, everything that we know, uh, that we have learned. Uh, now, I do agree with uh, Dr. Richards, who says that there is evidence that we need to understand Darwin's theory a little bit better. Or, you know, it's, it's a little 150 years old. for an ape-like creature to become a human? <laughs> well, let's, let's. They tell the kids that the human and the chimpanzee are related. The human and the orangutan are 96% similar. That proves a common ancestor 15 million years ago. Well, this is baloney. Barney Maddox, the leading, leading genome researcher, he said, the genetic difference between human and his nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, that's a gap of 48 million nucleotides, and a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an organ animal. There is no possibility of change. Kids, when they tell you that you have proof for evolution because the human and the chimpanzee are similar DNA, they're confused or they're lying to you. Actually, they've now discovered the difference is much greater. It's now 95%. Similarity instead of 
We've got tons of material on this on our website. The similarity between humans and chimps is much greater than they thought. I mean, the difference between the humans and chimps is much greater than they thought. Um, similar structures nearly always have similar plans, like DNA in this case. Similar bridges nearly always have similar blueprints. This hardly constitutes evidence that one sired the other or that they were erected by tornadoes. <laughs> Folks, complex things require a designer. And yet they tell the kids that humans and chimpanzees are similar. There are thousands of differences. But even if there are some similarities, so what? If you think the percentage of similarity proves something, let me show you the research I've been doing. I've discovered that clouds are 100% water. Watermelons are 97%. Only 3% difference. That proves watermelons evolve from clouds. <laughs> and I discovered jellyfish are 98% water. And... So are snow cones. <laughs> that proves how they evolved. Mm -hmm. If I told you, <clears throat> if you kissed a frog, it would turn to a prince. You say, no, frogs don't turn to princes. How many of you ladies got your husband by kissing a frog? Come on now, let me see. Only two, okay. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. But in the textbooks it does. Yes, boys and girls, we started like an amoeba. And we slowly evolved to a frog. There he is. Grandpa. And then very slowly evolved to a prince. It's the same, same fairy tale. Frog turns to prince. But see, instead of a kiss, no, they got a new magic ingredient. If the frog turns to the prince quickly, we all know it's a fairy tale. But if the frog turns to the prince slowly, that's modern science. It's the same fairy tale, folks, but they have a new magic ingredient. The new ingredient to turn the frog to a prince is billions and billions of years. How many have ever heard that expression before? Billions of years ago. It's on TV. It's on Carol Pagan's, Sagan's uh, show, Cosmos. Billions and billions of years ago. It's in the magazines. It's a national pornographic. I'm geographic. You know. Billions and billions of years ago. Here's a fourth grade textbook. Millions of years ago. Now, kids, listen. If anybody ever says, millions of years ago, just say, uh, excuse me, were you there? <laughs> They'll say, well, no, of course I wasn't there. And you can say, now, teacher, do you know the earth is millions of years old? I mean, is this really part of science? Is this something we can observe and study and test and demonstrate in the laboratory? Or is this just something people believe? They're going to say, well, everybody believes the earth is millions of years old. <laughs> no, they don't. Most Americans think the earth is less than 10,000 years old and God made it. Only 4% are atheistic. I think that 4% ought to go start themselves a private school and teach evolution to anybody that wants to pay and come learn it. And they ought to get it out of our public schools. That's my unbiased opinion. Yeah. The evolution theory says, this is grandpa. Now, maybe that doesn't offend you, but it ought to offend you if you love the Lord. That they're teaching you came from an ape-like ancestor, and the Bible says we're made in God's image. So what is the truth about the so-called cavemen? Those pictures you see in your book, kid, are pure imagination on the part of the artist. The per person who's commissioning the art can say, well, I want it to look a little more ape-like or a little more human-like. They can make it look however they want. Any artist can tell you that. Jack Cuazzo studied the Neanderthals very carefully. He went and studied the originals. He brought an x-ray machine with him. He's a dentist, studied uh, 32 years. He studied the growth of the human face as an orthodontist. You know, when you put braces on a kid who's 12 years old, it'd be nice to know what his face is going to look like when he's 40 to make sure the teeth still work. You don't want to arrange them so they look good when he's 12 and look bad when he's 40, right? So he studied all the original Neanderthals, the actual ones. He said, folks, the Neanderthals are nothing but old people with diseases. See, before the flood, they lived to be over 900. After the flood, they still lived to be 400 years old. And then 200, and then 100. Well, the bones of your face never stop growing. quazzo has got an excellent book on that and videotapes on this topic. The bones of your eyebrow ridge grow all your life. You don't notice it till you get to be 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 years old, but they start to stick out. A person that lived to be 2 or 300 would have big eyebrow ridges. And the back of the head would elongate because of the muscles always pulling your head back. That's where they attach. So the Neanderthals were nothing but perfectly normal humans who were living to be two or three hundred years old. They're not missing links. Read, get the book Buried Alive. You can get it from our website or on our catalog back there. Cro-Magnon Man was perfectly normal in every respect. So why do they call that a missing link? 
You put a suit and tie on him, walk him down the street, and nobody would look twice. They've got one in your textbooks now called Australopithecus africanus. That was proven wrong in 1973. It's not a missing link whatsoever. These guys spend all their free time digging in the dirt looking for bones. My dog did the same thing. <laughs> this textbook says, you're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Question. If evolution is true, how are the kids supposed to tell right from wrong? Question. Exactly how do we tell right from wrong? Pretty scary thought. Charles Darwin said, often, a cold shudder has run through me as I have asked myself whether I may have devoted myself to a fantasy. Well, Charlie, you did devote yourself to a fantasy. If you believe you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, you need help. You were designed for a purpose. Now, what is it? There are four great questions that every single religion in the world tries to answer. Even atheism, which is a religion, you have to believe there is no God. There's no way to know that. The four great questions every religion tries to answer. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer these questions depends upon how you view the world. There are basically only two ways to look at this world. One view says, you know, there's incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creationist worldview. Other people look at the world and say, you know, nobody made it. It just made itself. They don't believe God created the heaven and the earth. They think a big bang made this world from nothing. They attempt to declare what they believe. Humanism is a religion. You have to believe there is no God. So why is this theory dangerous? Evolution, I am convinced, after studying this now for 30-some years, evolution is absolutely the foundation for communism, Marxism, Nazism, socialism, racism. We'll get into some more of that in a minute. Number one, I think evolution is dangerous because it's bad science based on lies. Well, here's a textbook used in Minnesota, and it says that all of these ones in the circle here have been proven wrong, but they're still using them as evidence for evolution. They're lying to the kids. And they're calling, used to call modern man homo sapien. Today they're t calling us homo sapien sapien. Wow, what does that mean? Well, sapien means wise. So today we're the wise, wise man. That's interesting. You know, the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, if you believe your ancestors were a monkey, you're a fool. There's no question that some of my ancestors probably swung by their necks, but none of them swung by their tails. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> now look, if you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know it had any kids. You sure can't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? Hey, did you know chimpanzees are still having babies? Why don't they make another human and let's watch it this time? Hmm? See, evolution only happens in the imagination, never in reality. Humans never have any gill slits. It's a human at conception. It's not a fish or an amphibian or anything else. And abortion is murder, plain and simple. Okay? The appendix is not vestigial. You do need your appendix. The whale does not have a vestigial pelvis. That is a lie. The human tailbone is not vestigial. If you think it is, I'll pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. Man did not evolve from animals or cavemen. The Big Bang is a big dud. It didn't happen. The horse series in your textbooks is a lie, proven wrong 50 years ago. Life cannot evolve from non-living matter, like the textbook says. The law does not ban teaching creation science, like some people want you to think. It's perfectly fine to teach creation science in the public schools. We'll get into more of that later. Smaller is not simpler. A little paramecium is more complex than a space shuttle. Smaller is not simpler. Smaller is more complex. But birds did not come from dinosaurs. Talk about a dumb idea. The eye did not arise by slow changes over billions of years. The first bird did not hatch from a reptile egg, like Goldschmidt said. The trees of life in the textbooks are pure imagination. They didn't happen, folks. They drew it on paper, and that's as far as it goes. It didn't happen in reality. DNA does not prove evolution, it proves creation, it proves a designer. Fossils do not provide any evidence for evolution. Fossils don't count at all. You find a bone in the dirt, you can't prove that bone had any kids, <laughs> let alone kids that lived, and certainly not kids that were different than the grandparents. Fossils simply are a dead-end street. They don't count for evolution. Notice what the textbook says. 30 million years ago. Now, kids, let me translate that for you. Anytime a book says millions of years ago, what it really means is long ago and far away. 
It means a fairy tale is coming next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 30 million years ago, these critters evolved. Ooh, there's that word again. You've got to watch that one, remember? Six different meanings. It says they're ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans? Grandpa? <laughs> you know, we've been teaching our kids they're nothing but an animal, and today a lot of them act like animals. Barbara Reynolds figured it out. She's a liberal journalist. She said, your kids go ape in school? Here's why. He's being taught evolution. Guess what, Johnny? You're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Uh, you mean I'm just an animal? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you expect? Have you noticed the rock and roll music these days is all full of death and destruction and blood? Well, the Bible says they that hate me love death. That's the problem. Kids are taught today there are no absolutes. By the way, if evolution is true, that's exactly correct. I've asked this question to evolutionists all over the world. I've never had one answer, a simple question. I'll say, hey, sir or ma'am, I have a simple question for you. If evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? How does anybody tell right from wrong if evolution is true? They say there are no absolutes. One professor I debated said there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> Blew his little brain. Now, wait, 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 how can I be sure of that? Yeah. Yes, there are absolutes. Thus saith the Lord. That's absolute. And the Lord said, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. Some people, maybe, maybe they just don't know. Okay, I understand. Maybe they just don't care what God's Word says. But God told us what to do, and we're not doing it. Okay? Anyway, that's another long, interesting story. Uh, but if a teacher does get up in front of their class and teach evolution, if you get up there and say, okay, kid, listen, you started off like a slime and you very slowly evolved to a human. You don't need to be a genius to figure out that teaching is going to destroy some kid's faith in the Bible. And anybody that destroys a child's faith better see what Jesus has to say about that. He said, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus said, be not, or James said, be not many masters, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation.